Prog Legends Genesis are about to embark on the North American leg of their final tour, and I figured there's no better time to take a deeper look at one of their songs. Today I want to look at Ripples from the 1976 album A Trick of the Tale. To me this is one of the most beautiful and moving songs in prog rock history. This is actually one of the first prog rock songs that I ever heard. I didn't have anyone I knew growing up that listened to this kind of music, and I'm not even sure exactly how I came across this song, but I remember being instantly entranced by it as a 16-year-old. Looking at it now as a more mature and skilled musician, I think that the chord progressions and the way that the melodies interact with these chords is what makes this song so incredibly moving to me. Obviously the lyrics play a major role as well, but the beautiful harmonies are what bring these lyrics to life. Right off the bat, we have a really important harmonic technique that gets used all over this song, and that's pedal point. Pedal point is when one note, typically a bass note, stays the same while the harmony changes on top of it. This term comes from the organ and its ability to sustain notes indefinitely, which is usually done with the pedals of an organ, hence the term pedal point. Bluebells come in every side. Some are wise and some are the wise. They got pretty blue eyes. The song starts with these chords E with B in the bass, B major 7, B7 suspended, and E with B in the bass. We're in the key of E for the majority of this song, though it does weave in and out of E quite often, as we'll see later on. It pedals on B here with the chord shifting above that note. And it starts on the root chord of E, but in second inversion with B in the bass. This gives the chord a less resolved feeling than having it in the root position with E in the bass. So here's E in root position, and here's it with B in the bass. Next it moves to B major 7, which is outside of the key of E with the note A sharp. I'm viewing this in two ways. Firstly, as a borrowed chord from B major, which works well because we're pedaling on the note B here. Secondly, I'm thinking of this as a chromatic move. After the B major seven, it goes to B seven suspended, which has an A on the top, and then to E with B in the bass, which has a G sharp. So there's chromatic movement from B down to G sharp over the course of these four chords. Now I'm not going to talk too much about the instrumentation here, but I think the arrangement of the 12-string guitars and piano are incredibly well done. The guitars are fairly high up in register for most of the verse, with the left hand of the piano providing the bass notes for the most part. And this is the perfect accompaniment for Phil Collins' beautiful melodies. The verse continues with these chords. They got pretty blue eyes, for now a man may change. The chords here are as follows, G sharp minor 7 with B in the bass, D minor 6, E with D in the bass, or you can think of that as like D major 13 sharp 11. You have D minor 6 again, then C, D, and G. After the G-sharp minor, not a single one of these chords come from our parent key of E major. And once again, there's a lot of chromatic movement happening here. The seventh of G-sharp minor seven is F-sharp, and that moves a half step down to F for the D minor six chord, and then that moves another half step down to E for the E over D chord. And there's also one note that stays the same between all these chords, the note B. And that's helping to connect these together as well. There's also more pedal point happening here with D pedaling under the D minor 6 and the E over D. And you could also view chords like these as being borrowed from parallel modes through a process called modal mixture, where you move between modes that have the same root note. So D minor 6 is a D Dorian type of a sound and E over D is a D Lydian type of sound. Then we have this 4-5-1 resolution in the key of G. C, D, G. And G major is the relative major of E minor, which is the parallel minor to our home key of E major. So I'm viewing these chords as all being borrowed from the parallel minor, which I think makes sense, especially considering what happens in the second half of the verse. I really love the uplifting vibe that this resolution to G major gives. And then it jumps directly back to the E over B, which feels very melancholy. And this is a really great example of moving between different keys in a natural and musical way. The second half of the verse starts the same way as the first half, all the way up to the E over D chord, and then it moves on to this. The face in the water looks up 
she shakes her head as if to say that it's the last time you'll look like today. We have D sharp diminished seventh to E minor to D sharp diminished seventh C D seven over C and then B seven suspended to B seven. And I mentioned earlier about the parallel minor key of E minor, and this D-sharp diminished seventh chord is the leading tone chord moving to E minor, right? We also have chromatic movement from the previous chord. We have E over D, then D-sharp, diminished seventh, then E minor. And this move to the parallel minor sounds pretty dark and moody, and I think it helps with the momentum towards the chorus. The second time this D-sharp diminished seventh chord plays, it resolves down to C which in this case is acting as a less dark sounding substitute for E minor. So with this, and then. And from here we get more pedal points. We have C, and then D7, with C in the bass. And this is similar to what we had earlier of C to D, and then that went to G. But here we're gonna pedal on the C, because we're not gonna go to G. We're gonna go to B7 suspended, and then to B7. And B7 is the five chord in our tonic key of E, so that's gonna move us into the chorus really well. Now it's on to the chorus. The chorus is considerably simpler harmonically, which is a good idea when you're writing a chorus or big melodic section. It helps to make this chorus even more memorable. And the chords are as follows. A major 7, B over A, E major, E7, F sharp minor 9, and then F sharp suspended to F sharp. I mentioned that the chord right before the chorus is the 5 chord in E, B7. But the chorus actually starts on A major 7, which is the 4 chord in E. So this 5 chord isn't resolving to E like you'd expect it to. And this is what is called a deceptive cadence. There's more pedal point happening here with the A major 7 to B over A. And while most of these chords stay in the key of E, there are a few that go out. There's this E7, which adds some color to the movement to the F sharp minor 9. And there's also an F sharp major chord which is the major two chord in E. And you usually see this as a secondary dominant which resolves to the dominant or five chord. So you'd have F sharp, then the five chord B, and then to E, right? That kind of a sound. But here it just moves back to the A major seven. But that major two is a very common non-diatonic chord. The chorus chords are awesome, but it's the melody that makes this part really special. Most of this melody is dealing with the upper extensions of chords. On the A major 7, it starts on the major 7 G sharp. Sail away, away. And the major 7 is always a good choice for a melody note on a major 7 chord. And then on the E, we have the 9th F sharp. Never come back. On the F sharp minor 9, we have the 9th G sharp. To the other side. And the 9th is kind of the money note on a minor chord. Just sounds really good. I use that all the time in my melodies. Can't go wrong with that. One thing I think is cool is that on the two chords that are outside of the key of E, E7 and F sharp, the melody is actually on the root of these chords. And then here. So we're hitting upper extensions on the diatonic chords. And then root notes on the non-diatonic chords. 
And more than anything else, I think this melody just sounds good, and I can't imagine anything else being here. It's an example of a perfect melody, in my opinion. At the end of the chorus, it resolves to E and hangs there before going to the second verse with this piano figure. <laughs> This reminds me of something I talked about in my Tigran Hamasian video, which is the idea of a cloud of harmony. In this case, almost every note from the key of E is playing here. And it's creating this cloud of E major. The second verse and chorus repeat with the exact same harmony. The chorus does get doubled in length the second time, which is a very common and useful writing trick. And there's a lot of dynamic build up here as well. The drums kick in in the second chorus and the bass comes in full force. The overall dynamics make a massive impact throughout this entire song, with everything building really nicely to the chorus each time it happens. After the second chorus, it goes to the bridge, which completely changes gears from the rest of the song. This long bridge section has always felt very classically inspired to me, from the piano arpeggios to the interplay between the backwards lead guitar and the lead synth to the harmonic choices. Where the verse and chorus dealt with a lot of more extended chords that felt very jazz influenced, here there's a lot more triads, albeit with lots of inversions. There's also a tempo shift and an overall groove change here. This is a pretty common prog writing technique to have the bridge of a song go somewhere completely different. It helps to add that unpredictable nature to the music. And this long bridge builds so nicely back to the chorus at the end that it makes the whole song much more impactful for me. It holds on E major at the end of the second chorus, and then a low C sharp creeps in underneath, as well as the new tempo. And essentially we're just moving from E major to the relative minor of C sharp minor. And this is a really common thing to do if you want to add some change to a new section to just move to the relative minor. There are a whole bunch of chords here and I'm going to try to touch on all of them. To do this, I'm going to break the bridge into four sections. And here's the first. It starts on the tonic chord of C-sharp minor and then goes to B minor with D in the bass. And that happens again. And this B minor chord I'm viewing as being borrowed from C-sharp Phrygian, some cool modal mixture. Then we have an A chord with E in the bass. Then we have C-sharp minor with G-sharp in the bass. Then E in the bass. So the fifth, third, and then we go to F-sharp major. And this whole progression is fairly straightforward, but the inversions are what make this sound unique. If I played all these chords in root position, you'd get this. Which is fine, but it has a lot more life with different bass notes happening. The second section of the bridge goes like this. This starts the same as the previous section until the F-sharp minor with C-sharp in the bass. And from there, the bass line moves in stepwise motion within the key and harmonizes the bass notes with more inversions. It ends here on a G-sharp major chord with D-sharp in the bass. And this is the five chord in C-sharp minor. A major five chord in a minor key is something you hear all over the place. It's this kind of a sound. The third section of the bridge goes like this. Once again, more chord inversions here, and there's this cool descending progression in the middle. I especially like the B over A chord. I use that chord for a Lydian sound, and it works well here as a passing chord. At the end of this section, there's a secondary dominant chord, the 5 of 5, in this case a D sharp major. 
And this resolves to the major five chord of G sharp. It's this kind of a sound. And secondary dominants are incredibly common, especially in classical music. And these kind of progressions are what give this bridge that classical feel. And here's the last section of the bridge. Here the pedal point comes back, this time on F sharp. You have C sharp minor to B minor, just like the beginning of the bridge. But this time pedaling on F sharp. Which gives them a very different flavor. And the end of this section has B minor 7 to E7 repeating. This is a 2-5 progression in the key of A. And vamping these two chords is really common, especially in funk. And a 2-5 is also the most common jazz chord progression. So this bridge is still maintaining some of that jazz influence. After it gets here, the entire bridge up to this point gets repeated, with the dynamics and orchestration building. Then it moves to the chorus chord progression, but over the feel and tempo from the bridge. This is a nice way to lead back to the chorus and connect these two very different parts of the song together. And then the chorus repeats until the song fades out. I love the piano in the last chorus, it sounds really triumphant with these big moving chords. And some of the sounds from the bridge, like the high synth lead, continue into this last chorus, further connecting the bridge to the chorus. So there it is, all the chords from Ripples by Genesis. This song is a great example of prog songwriting. It's complex, long, heavily layered, and sophisticated, but also simple, catchy, and moving. Nostalgia with music is interesting. Sometimes I go back to songs I loved when I was younger and they don't do much for me now. But if anything, this song is even better to me now, and that is the sign of music that can really stand the test of time. If you're a prog fan and you haven't listened to early Genesis, especially pre-1980, then you need to. It's some of the best prog rock ever made, and it's a great blend of experimentation and complexity with fantastic songwriting. Go give Ripples a listen and try to take some of these harmonic concepts into your own music. There are a lot of very cool and useful sounds inside these chord progressions, and I want to hear more interesting chords in modern prog, because I think it's something that's really lacking these days. As always, if you enjoyed this lesson, subscribe, hit the bell notification, like, comment, share, and until next time, stay proggy.